Okay. Okay, welcome everyone and welcome to our session. We are very happy and excited to be here today. And today we are going to talk about uh, the world of shadow vulnerabilities in AI. So let's get started. Now, uh, we'll start with an honest disclaimer that we work on a runtime security product, but we did try to uh, keep it as objective as possible. And our sole intention is to share everything that uh, we learned over the past uh, few years with you guys. So I'm Avi Romelski, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm, a city, uh, I'm a security researcher in the city office of Oligo Security. I have around 10 years of experience uh, in R&D. I focus these days more on security research, but previously on AI engineering. And on my spare time, I love mountaineering, so if you're into climbing, let me know afterwards. And with me is Nitsan. My name is Nitsan. I'm a security researcher also in Odigo. And I work on our uh, amazing detection product and uh, have experience of security research and the software development. And also, uh, I really, really love baking. So uh, let's see what we have baked for you to for today's session. Hi, so um, uh, a little bit about what's going to be covered. First, we'll dive into what are shadow vulnerabilities and why they are here to stay, because uh, they're uh, like a persistent threat. And they will keep happening, and we'll understand why. Then we'll understand why they're in particular very common in AI. And uh, we'll dive into some real-world examples of shadow vulnerabilities that led to actual attacks that took place. And finally, we'll understand how we can protect ourselves from them because they are shadow vulnerabilities and they are invisible. And we will have time for questions, so uh, please write them down if you have any. Let's go. Okay, so we will start with uh, what are shadow vulnerabilities and we will exp explain uh, why do they exist. So uh, shadow vulnerabilities is a pattern. It's, it's a pattern we found in many open source uh, libraries, many popular ones. And those are vulnerabilities that just don't have a CV assigned, or their CV is just uh, disputed. And just like the famous metaphor of a tree falling in the forest and no one knows, uh, so it's not the exact case here, because someone does know about them. Those are the maintainers of the library, who are usually aware to those security pitfalls, and they just mark them as a no fix and just pass the responsibility to the library's users. They said it's your responsibility to use it uh, right, and it's part of the intended behavior of the library. So those actually make the libraries vulnerable by design. We will also touch a specific type of shadow vulnerabilities we call uh, silent misconfigurations, which actually means just configured the way uh, the library was configured in a way that's exposed the users uh, to attacks. So we will see examples of it. And the funny thing about shadow vulnerabilities is that they actually usually in the documentations of the libraries. Um, but most of us, including me, just don't read the documentations before starting to use the library. So here is where the problem starts. Okay, so we brought here uh, multiple examples of documentation warnings uh, from the most uh, popular open source libraries. So. Here is one of the pickle modules saying pickle is insecure and you shouldn't unpickle from untrusted source. And another one from the NumPy library saying this function, NumPy load, is just not secure, can lead to arbitrary code execution. And from the joblib uh, f uh, function, and pandas, and many, many, many more. Sorry. So those warnings are there for a reason, but we usually just ignore them. And actually, we can't expect developers to just read all the documentations of libraries before starting to using them. Um, we, we just can't expect them to fix uh, CVs that are assigned. Um, so those warnings are just not enough. Now, we want to dive into a specific type of shadow vulnerability just to understand the idea. Uh, so I bet you know uh, snake YAML. Uh, so YAML is uh, everywhere. Everything in Kubernetes is uh, YAML. And uh, snake YAML is the go-to when you talk about uh, Java, when you want to parse YAML files. And if it's very, very popular one. And if you uh, read snake YAML documentation, it just says uh, snake YAML allows you to construct any type of Java object. Any type? Yeah, any type. So apparently, it does uh, allow you to construct any type. 
including this payload, which actually brings a uh, remote code execution. Uh, so as you can see, it just uh, downloads a malicious jar and then uh, executes it. And this is uh, uh, done by the default constructor of Snake YAML. So it's the default one, the one that most of, most of us use. And the interesting part here is what do the maintainer of the Snake YAML library has to say about that vulnerability? So if you look into the documentation of Snake YAML, it says it all. Someone does try to um, uh, just uh, report this uh, vulnerability to the, to the Snake YAML maintainer. But uh, the maintainer just uh, don't refer this as a problem. It just marks this uh, vulnerability as a no fix. And it just recommends the users to use the safe constructor instead of the default one. But uh, it just leaves the option of using the default one uh, open. So it turns out that for the maintainer, uh, this remote code execution, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And it's just a classic example of shadow vulnerability. Uh, we will see more examples later on. Amazing. So let's understand um, why shadow vulnerabilities are so common specifically in AI. Um, in order to understand it, let's divide the AI landscape uh, of security into two main pillars. First, there is the AI model and everything around the uh, model itself, the inputs, the outputs of the model, and how we treat them in the application level. And then we have the AI infrastructure, with, which is usually open source uh, because it's a, a very uh, fastly emerging technology and fastly adopted, so we must use open source. Uh, but not every project is a CNCF project, and uh, they do include shadow vulnerabilities, um, and both of them might include shadow vulnerabilities. These are the two main pillars. Now, why is it uh, in particular uh, common in AI? First, because as I said, it's fastly adopted, so there is a lot of new code that um, includes bugs. That's simply a way to be discovered. And this makes AI a prime uh, target for attackers because everything is in one place. And um, attackers love it. They love gold mines. They love um, trying to uh, hack or successfully hack into a single uh, asset and have everything they want in a single place. And AI is, is usually like that because AI um, models are intellectual property and they have a lot of connections to databases and knowledge graphs. And the people who develop the models or the code around the model are not security um, engineers. They're data scientists, AI engineers, AI researchers. And they're simply not measured for the security uh, of their code or for using the tool the right way. They're simply measured for velocity. Um, and it, it's, it makes a lot of sense. Now, maybe the most interesting part is that models are essentially code, and they have runtime, and people tend to forget it. Now, let's dive into some real-world examples of shadow vulnerabilities. Um, all of those actually led to attacks. Some of them are firstly discussed here in this uh, session for the first time, like Ray. But we'll begin with PyTorch uh, TorchServe. Then we'll talk about TensorFlow, about uh, Shadow Raid afterwards. And uh, finally, uh, if we'll have enough time, um, we'll mention uh, Jinja 2 and things that happened uh, in the past year. So let's get started with PyTorch. OK, so I guess you know uh, PyTorch TorchServe. If you worked uh, with PyTorch models, it's a tool for uh, allowing uh, users just to serve PyTorch models in production. And it's actually the default uh, way to do it. It's uh, the recommended one, the one in the official uh, site of the PyTorch. And uh, it's very, very uh, popular one. It has one, uh, over uh, 1 million Docker app pools. And as you can see in the image, many leading companies, leading projects adopted it, uh, including uh, AWS Neuron, MLflow, Kubeflow, and many, many more. So it's very, very popular. Now, let's dive into the story of uh, shadow vulnerabilities inside uh, TorchServe. So, uh, ShellTorch is the name we gave to a chain of vulnerabilities uh, we found in Oligo that together allow remote code execu execution, model theft, and po model poisoning. Now, the last two are very interesting because uh, model theft, just think of someone steals uh, ChatGPT's models, it's their entire uh, IP. So this can actually uh, bring companies down. And 
when you get to model poisoning, it just means altering the way the model works. So it just changes its all, uh, its all the decisions, and it can be very harmful. So uh, all those uh, model seeding and model poisoning might sound to you like a doomsday scenario, but we proved that those can be executed with the default deployment of TorchServe without changing anything. So here you can see the chain of the vulnerabilities that together create uh, this attack. And together we are going to focus uh, two of them, the shadow vulnerabilities, and just understand their part in the story. Amazing. So um, let's discuss the first issue that enabled uh, infiltrating the uh, PyTorch servers in first place and uh, the first uh, vulnerability, which is a shadow vulnerability, and it's around the management console. So if you're a hacker, if you're a developer, both of them love management consoles because real-world applications are dynamic and um, they change all the time. So management consoles um, are very common and we love them, we use them. Uh, but they are also a prime target for attackers. So if you have a management console, be sure that it will be abused or uh, will be researched. Now, interestingly, the documentation, again, of uh, PyTorch TorchServe uh, claims that it is accessible only from localhost, uh, by default. So um, it should run on port 8081 and be accessible only from localhost or loopback, um, but we'll see about that. Now, we went on and validated it, and we looked at the config properties um, file of the default uh, um, Docker file uh, in the Python Torsof project, and we found that it was using 0000, which is all the network interfaces, meaning that anyone with network access can do anything in the management API. Now, let's see what exactly can one do in the management API, and um, you can see that the documentation is very misleading. It's not localhost. And uh, if that was not enough, um, we found this hard-coded value of uh, um, Lubeck uh, that is literally printed in, uh, um, in the Docker uh, startup uh, process. And you can see that it simply uses an echo command without string formatting or anything. So if you even change the, even if you'll change the config properties file, it will just end up uh, printing the same thing over and over again. So um, it's hard-coded and it's, uh, even more confusing than uh, just the documentation. So the documentation and the Docker logs will uh, not uh, uh, be correlative to the uh, runtime and the things that actually happen. Now, interestingly, it allows us to register new models, which can, um, we can consider it as model poisoning, because we can alter the results of the model and affect end users using a single HTTP request that we'll see soon. And it can be done by anyone from anywhere. You can scale the model, you can try new versions, and it makes a lot of sense because it's widely used for A-B testing, trying new models, um, and basically it's an essential part of TorServe, like any inference server has a management API, even others, but um, the lack of authorization and the, the fact that it is binding on 0, 0, 0, 0 um, it's available to anyone on the internet or anyone with network access, uh, which is very alarming. Now, let's understand how uh, it's all connected to the snake camel example from the beginning. And this is the next stage. It's so I'll pass it back to you. OK, so remember the snake camel issue? So apparently, also TorchServe uses a snake camel. We found it in the, in the uh, sort, source code. So this function is taken from the uh, code. Uh, the read spec file, you can see it just creates a YAML object, then uses it to load the YAML file. Very simple. But unfortunately, they used here the default constructor, which is vulnerable to remote code execution, like we said. And in uh, TorchServe, the uh, read spec file is just part of the uh, flow that registers a new model. So uh, the YAML file uh, describes a new model uh, in TorchServe. And as you can see, all we had to do in order to exploit this, we just created this YAML file that uh, describes a new model, and we just changed the second line. We inserted there the uh, payload that just downloads a remote jar and executes it, a malicious one. And that's why we uh, got a remote code execution in every torch serve deployment. And like we said before, TorchServe is not like a simple web server. It's uh, the core uh, server that's uh, 
holds all the AI models of a company, so it's very, very harmful. And just to sum up the torch surf story, we have nothing to do with uh, zero days getting published all the time, but those two issues, the misconfiguration and the snake yammer issue, we're known to the maintainers, and they just could have been fixed before we used them. Amazing. So uh, before diving into TensorFlow, I just wanted to emphasize um, that TorchServe is the de default deployment uh, server of PyTorch. And uh, in our research, we found thousands of instances. Among them are very big uh, organizations and companies. And uh, it's all happened because of uh, two shadow vulnerabilities and silent misconfigurations. So they are common and they can happen even to the largest organizations, including Meta, because we are all humans and uh, it's open source. So you cannot keep track of all the changes that all the maintainers do through time. And not all the maintainers have the entire context of the uh, project, so some of them might not know uh, one thing uh, and m others might. Um, so uh, it will happen and it will keep happening in the largest projects all the time. Now let's go to TensorFlow. We, we're done with the uh, PyTorch, which is the largest deployment framework. Now let's talk about the second biggest, um, which is TensorFlow. And Keras, in, in, uh, specifically, is a part of TensorFlow. It's in, integrated in TensorFlow's uh, API, and it's a legacy AI framework, not really legacy, but older than TensorFlow. And people love it, and uh, it is used uh, to this day, and they keep maintaining it. And if you look on the figure below of a neural network, you usually think of a mathematical computation and you don't expect it to have runtime, right? You, you look at this figure, you don't uh, expect it to have code or Python code. Um, but that's actually uh, not true. TensorFlow says out loud that models are code, models are programs. And evaluating models from untrusted source is literally equivalent to running code from untrusted source. Even if you use the safe formats like saved model, uh, you have the chance of exploitation on deserialization, and deserialization attacks keep happening to this day everywhere like we've seen in Snake Camel. Um, so they say it uh, at the first line of their security documentation, which is awesome, by the way. And this is also simply not enough, and we'll see why uh, in a bit, but people don't read the security documentation. Uh, even, even like me, I, I do it because I try to research and find uh, shadow vulnerabilities at scale, but uh, you cannot expect all the users of TensorFlow to be aware of that, uh, especially because they lack security orientation. Now, let's talk about the specific layer in Keras, uh, which is under, under tf.keras.layers, uh, which is a Lambda layer. Um, and if you know Lambda from Python, it can execute arbitrary Python code. Now, if you look at, on the, at the Lambda layer implementation uh, when saving it to disk or uh, loading it from disk, so it uses the Marshall module. Uh, in Python, it's a building module for serializing Python bytecode to disk and deserializing back to Python uh, bytecode, uh, which can just be evaluated elsewhere. And this way, people um, and AI practitioners could define AI um, functions that are literally in Python instead of the supporters, uh, supported layers of Keras. And Marshall is not considered safe, and they even say it in their documentation. Um, but TensorFlow did their best, and they tried to tell users models can run code, so be aware of that. And they really, um, we have nothing to say about it. It's out there, uh, everybody, know, everybody knows about it. And uh, that's it, basically. Now let's see how it can be exploited and abused. Okay, so I guess you know that AI models can be uh, saved to files, just to share with other people, or saving uh, the current state of a model, just like a snapshot. And in Keras, they use uh, multiple formats, and one of them is the HDA5 format, H5 extension, which is a legacy one. And as you can see, you can just save uh, the model uh, using the save function and then load it using the load model function, so it's very simple. Uh, the interesting part here is that as a part of its flow, the load model function, when you give it a model that contains a lambda layer, that we saw before, just uh, unmarshal it, which, like we said, is unsafe. So that's got us uh, thinking. 
So what we did here is just to create a new model and just edit a Lambda layer, which contains this piece of code. Here is just a print a, a command, a just prints a message. And then we saved it use, using the model.save uh, function to H5 checkpoint, export H5 checkpoint. And then all we had to do as an attackers is just to pass this malicious model to targets. And when it gets loaded, the code is executed. So do we have here another uh, remote code execution with no CVE? Let's see. So we have a good news. Uh, after two years, uh, this issue uh, exists. Keras finally had a CV assigned to this issue. And they added this uh, safe mode argument. As you can see, it's uh, true by default. And it's uh, just uh, used to prevent this, uh, this attack. And they say uh, it just prevent, prevents this arbitrary code execution. So we really saw this issue is not uh, relevant anymore. We were about to remove it from this session. But then we read this line. And as you can see, they just say here loudly, uh, this check of the safe mode argument just don't happen when you talk about H5 checkpoints. So it just ignored. And we actually got here a kind of a downgrade attack, because all an attacker can do is just take the old Keras version, create a H5 checkpoint, and then just pass it to the target. And even if the target uses the most, the newest version of Keras TensorFlow, the code is still going to be executed because this argument is just ignored. So to validate this, we just executed our uh, uh, old H5 checkpoint using the most, uh, the newest versions of Keras TensorFlow, as you can see. And you will see in a moment, the code just got executed again. So here is the loading. And the message was printed. So it got executed just like before. So I guess the Keras users will just uh, had to get to wait to another fix to be truly safe from remote code execution. Now, let's talk a little bit about the impact. We found many uh, popular open source tools that are vulnerable to this remote code execution. One of them is TFLight Converter. It's an open source tool to just convert uh, models to TFLight format. And when we uh, got it, the H5 checkpoint, uh, the code was just executed. By the way, I have a typo here in the TensorFlow output file, TensorFlow with OE, but uh, it still works, so I don't care. <laughs> OK, and another one, which is a very popular one, is Apache Beam. And in their documentation, they also they say out loudly they use uh, H5 checkpoints, as you can see. So we just used the default commands from the documentation. And again, the code was executed. So those are just two examples of uh, how this uh, remote code execution with has no, have no CVE uh, in Keras TensorFlow affects the most popular open source tools in the industry. And just a reminder, you won't have any CVE, not in uh, Keras, Apache Beam, or uh, TF Lite Converter. All of those are just vulnerable by design. Yeah, now before talking about my favorite part, which is uh, Shadow Ray that I've uh, personally worked on. So I just want to emphasize that uh, what we've seen now is, uh, I consider it personally a zero day vulnerability because it's a bypass of a CVE that was recently applied and uh, published in April. Uh, and it's also the maintainer's choice to support the legacy format because they want users to uh, be able to use the, the open source still in the way that they were used. Um, but it's silent, and this is what I want you to remember. You will not see uh, anything about this kind of attack or uh, the possibility of the attack happening uh, in any um, tool uh, out there. So now let's talk about Shadow Ray. Now before diving into Ray, which is amazing and I love it, um, I want you to understand the scope of the attack. Shadow Ray was the first attack on AI infrastructure that targeted AI workloads in the wild. Uh, it was discovered by us, by Oligo, and um, the impact was tremendous. It was even on Forbes uh, exclusively, and we'll see it soon. But uh, the amazing part here is that a single shadow vulnerability led to the largest and first uh, attack ever recorded on AI infrastructure. And we proved here that AI uh, infrastructure is targeted, and not hypothetically, but uh, it is being exploited 
in the wild for at least one year. Um, so uh, it is amazing, a very interesting story. I wish I had more time to cover uh, everything, but we have some more material online. I can do 40 minutes just on Ray, I think. Um, but uh, OK, let's understand. Um, what is Ray? Ray is essentially like uh, Kubernetes for AI. It's a generic job runner to scale AI workloads for training, inference purposes, or data processing pipelines. And some of you might be thinking of it as a replacement for multiprocessing module in Python. So it's very convenient. It changed the way that I personally work with uh, Python and multiprocessing and changed my mindset. And not just me. You can see that it is used by the largest organizations out there, including OpenAI, uh, which is my favorite uh, testimonial. I think uh, th they say out loud um, that th we use Ray to train ChatGPT and our largest model to this day. And uh, I think there I, I think it says it all, right? It's literally everywhere used by the largest companies to scale AI. Now, the story begins in late 2023 when uh, five unique vulnerabilities were reported by Anyscale um, published uh, through a blog, a blog post um, with five CVEs. And one of the CVEs was disputed, which is the most interesting one. And this CVE talks about the REST API of the jobs uh, dashboard, um, which is um, lacking authorization. And as we said before, um, attackers search for these disputed vulnerabilities, and this is a goldmine to them. And when we saw it, we um, wanted to validate and understand what is the impact, that do anyone already exploiting it or not? And what we did was uh, literally, as you can see uh, in the figure below, it's a Ray dashboard that luckily for us includes also the jobs history, so we could threaten the attackers and understand everything they did. But these are real commands that attackers ran. Among them are, are uh, the top line, which is a wget command. I know if you can see the font or not. But it's a wget that is piped to a bash uh, command, uh, which downloads um, just like a privilege escalation payload and uh, gaining persistence on the machine uh, using sudo and, and so on. So um, let's understand why the vulnerability was disputed, what is the vulnerability, and so on. So know that the vendor's position in this case is that Ray is not in intended uh, to use outside of a strictly controlled uh, uh, environment, which makes a lot of sense because like Kubernetes, Ray cannot enforce each and every application or approve it in advance or create a policy for each and every application because it has too many use cases and everybody uses it differently. You cannot just add authorization just like that or you cannot um, restrict it, and they just count on the users, which makes a lot of sense, by the way. I completely understand them, and their security team is amazing. We work closely with them. Um, so we understood their position that uh, it's an essential part of Ray, and uh, Ray's sole intention is to run arbitrary jobs and arbitrary code. Of course, most of the time for some of us it's Python, but they don't limit it only to Python. Now, um, what's the interesting part of Ray is that uh, the default deployment uses 0000, um, which exposes the assets to the internet, as we said before, if you lack security groups or firewalls on top of that. Now, I want you to understand what data was found on the compromised servers, and I'm talking about thousands of clusters. Uh, each cluster is an IP address that behind uh, the, this IP address, you can see uh, thousands of GPUs, sometimes uh, just a few hundreds, but pricey GPUs, pricey machines, that made uh, the attackers very, very happy. And we'll see why. So first, you, uh, they hacked into the AI workloads um, and got production DB credentials um, and got passwords. So these are all real outputs uh, that the attackers put hands on. And uh, they were in the job history. We found some private SSH keys uh, that made them uh, uh, easy on a um, just walking between servers and SSHing uh, and so on. And OpenAI, I personally uh, love them, and uh, of course we did report them through a designated bug bounty form on Google, but uh, sadly I did not get any bounty, so I need someone else to sponsor my Everest, Everest expedition. But uh, uh, besides OpenAI tokens, we, see, uh, we saw and found Hugging Face tokens, Stripe tokens, don't ask me why, Stripe was uh, on an AI uh, Stripe tokens were on an AI uh, application, and I am sure it made the attackers happy. And if that was not enough, you can see complete account takeover because uh, Ray has high privileges, um, and um, it's just by design, so we could do anything uh, they want, uh, the attackers, on the uh, compromised machines. 
Now, I don't have time for the threat hunting, but it was really fun. Um, as you can see, we have some encrypted payloads and connections, and we actually saw that several crypto miners um, competed over the same resources, pricey GPUs, which is very, very funny. They started pick killing each other and killing each other uh, upon startup, and <laughs> they literally uh, competed over the compromised assets. And um, I think the, uh, the, the top uh, moment was the publication on Forbes exclusively, uh, which made a lot of buzz. And uh, just to summarize everything so far, it was the first attack on the infrastructure, um, and it led to thousands of organizations getting compromised, and a lot of compute for attackers that was leveraged, and, um, and that's it, basically. You can read about it more online. I wish I had more time. Now, um, let's talk quickly about Jinja. Okay, so we will do it very quickly. Uh, so I, uh, you might know uh, Jinja, Jinja 2. It's a Python library for uh, template rendering. And it's very known to be vulnerable by design to something called uh, template injection, uh, which can lead to remote code execution. So here is a classic uh, payload. And this is a very not uh, new issue. Actually, the first publishment we found of this issue was over there in 2015, which is almost a decade ago. And what is a connection to AI? Uh, Jinja is not a, an AI library, but uh, in the last few months, uh, two uh, very critical vulnerabilities were found in two very popular uh, AI libraries, Lama CPP and Light LLM. And uh, one of them was uh, also mentioned as uh, Lama Drama. And those are, uh, the, all of those uh, drama could have been prevented because those are just a direct result of this template injection in Jinja 2, which, like we said, is, uh, just exists for a more, of a, a more of a decade. So it's pretty amazing. Now let's talk about how to protect yourselves from those shadow vulnerabilities. Okay, so the first point is that we believe that shadow vulnerabilities need to be called out. We should keep uh, maintainers, fix them, and we should make developers aware of them. And it's a community effort, just like that. And we uh, believe that uh, they are just here to stay and that we, they will always exist. So as long as they are here, we believe that a runtime solution is needed for detecting those uh, shadow vulnerabilities. Uh, why runtime? Because uh, those shadow vulnerabilities, like we said before, have no CVEs. So all of those scanning tools running in build time in uh, the left side are just not enough. The, the shadow vulnerabilities are just invisible to them. And we also wanted to introduce you with a concept we call uh, open source library sandboxing. So in Oligo, we have uh, eBPF technology we developed that uh, monitor uh, applications, everything that's happening in runtime. And using this technology, we collect uh, data of uh, the behavior of open source libraries. And then we just create profiles of the baseline of the behavior of the libraries. And then we are able to detect deviations from that profiles. So the best thing about this uh, approach is that uh, no CV is required because we just look at the behavior of the library. And just like with snake YAML that's don't supposed to run arbitrary code or uh, some parser library that's just don't supposed to open a network connection or the Keras library just that's just don't supposed to uh, create a child process so here is an example we executed here the Keras exploit we saw before and as you can see the oligo platform detected it uh, detected the deviation from the Keras library profile and you can also see the Python call stack, uh, so the load mod model function, which leads to the lambda coding, uh, which leads to the creation of the child process. And it's just like one example of how we are able to detect such attacks without needing any CVE. All right, so let's uh, quickly conclude everything we uh, talked about so far, and we have time maybe for like one, qu qu one question. Um, we talked about why, what are shadow vulnerabilities, why they're here to stay, and we understood that they are very common, in particularly in AI, because everything is so dynamic and uh, fastly uh, emerging. 
uh, we understood uh, that there are uh, attacks out there that already have happened because of shadow vulnerabilities. We gave you four real use cases. Uh, among them uh, are uh, PyTorch, Ray, TensorFlow, and Jinja. And uh, we have much more. We didn't have enough time to talk about everything we found, but we uh, managed to automate this process and scale our uh, um, scalar method. Uh, we talked about it in other conferences, in uh, DEF CON and so. Uh, you can find it online if it interests you, but uh, we really believe that the way to solve this issue is to create a community effort. Um, and as a community, we need to um, be able to detect shadow vulnerabilities, call them out, and let users know that they are impacted, or at least understand the risk before using the open source. And uh, that's it, basically. Thank you very much for your time, and we have some uh, time for questions. Maybe one or two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think creating baselines is very important, but uh, the idea is mostly be, uh, around the relation between the maintainers and the users. So we need to find a way for uh, maintainers to be incentive, uh, to have incentive to uh, prioritize the fix of those vulnerabilities and actually uh, fix them uh, instead of saying that it's a default behavior and uh, it is what it is and, and that's it, you know? You need to understand the variety of use cases and uh, unless today, uh, today unless you find it exploited in the wild, so they don't really care about it. If you look at the exit use case or, uh, and so on, you have a single maintainer that um, because of, um, because it was only a single maintainer, it enabled uh, so much power to, for a single person, uh, which then um, created another attack like in the scale of log for shell uh, and in this this is a classic example of a logging library that opens a network connection and it should not it should only file uh, write files to disk right and the same can be uh, said on xz it 's a compression library, and our profile knows that it should only compress and uncompress data and it should not run os dot system commands for example. And uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, we're done. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.